Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody's classroom is filled with nitrogen dioxide gas. First, I want to say that I'm not making something like fluorine chemistry. I'm more making polymer chemistry nowadays. But I still have this story, which my teachers once told to me, as we were taught about fluorine. In one of the universities close to me, there was a special fluorine lab, which had things like liquid fluorine or even chlorine trifluoride, which is why it was a few kilometers away from the main university and the city it was in. One day, they thought it would be fun to do the reaction of the liquid fluorine that they had with a pretty big piece of cesium, which is a terrible idea. But this lab was known for such experiments. So they just broke open an ampule of cesium and threw it directly into a test tube that had something like 5 to 10 milliliters of liquid fluorine inside it. Luckily, they did that from a safe distance. To say the least, a part of the university exploded, or at least the whole fume hood and everything around it. From what I heard, luckily, no one died, but some there got seriously injured. A few years later, the lab was repaired again, but in the following years, the same lab exploded and caught fire again a few times, which is probably pretty scary for everyone that worked there. But this accident with the cesium was still the worst thing that happened there. Now the lab doesn't have any issues, but that's just because there isn't a fluorine lab now. There's an expression in the fluorine chemistry community that you have old fluorine chemists and reckless fluorine chemists, but you don't have old reckless fluorine chemists. I'll offer up another that legitimately could have ended in being eaten by some very spicy water if at least one person hadn't been paying attention. Now we've got a pretty extensive bulk chemical unloading procedure because we get them by the literal tanker truck. Seals got a match and you need three different signups that concur we have received the correct thing because mixing any of the three listed in the above story results in only slightly differing degrees of catastrophic. Well, most people's brains, I guess, had just left the building that day or something because we got a new shipment of potassium hydroxide and everyone on hand proceeded to ignore all procedures, pencil whipped paperwork and accepted a shipment with wrong and busted seals. Literally everything was a screw up and started pumping that tanker right into our bulk tank of spicy water our 50% hydrogen peroxide. I'm not privy to the video footage, but I'm told the reaction was rather immediate. Thankfully, they shut the valves in time to the tank, and the vents and overflows on the tank did their job, so at least we didn't end up with a frightening sort of pressure vessel. Ended up venting an unbelievable amount of steam and probably pure oxygen into the air. You could see the cloud from about 15 miles away. Reweighed the tanker, and the best we can figure, about 300 gallons of our potassium hydroxide went into the bulk peroxide. Afterward, it took the tank about four days to cool down before we could even do anything with it. Temperature probes were melted, but the way the cooler changed meant that we had to have it inspected to make sure we didn't anneal it too much. Turned to dusty bronze, so approximately 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my gosh. That's such a crazy story. And this is one of the scariest things about large amounts of chemicals, is when things go wrong, they really go wrong. So it's my first day in an inorganic lab as an undergrad. We started running a vacuum distillation, oil pump, two inch wide trap cooled with liquid nitrogen. And after a few minutes of heating with a heat gun, a glass stopper pops off, which should not happen under vacuum. My advisor immediately investigated and concluded that there was no vacuum being pulled. So we removed the doer and the trap isn't full. Then my advisor notices about an inch of blue at the bottom of the trap, liquid oxygen. We had condensed about 15 to 20 milliliters of liquid oxygen over the past 24 hours. Some others in the group used the vacuum to dry some ammonium carbonate, and there must have been a leak in the Schlenk line somewhere. We put up a blast shield around the trap and let it vent. We then evacuated the lab, nobody exploded, and it took four hours for eh &S to clear us to re-enter the lab. So the issue here is oxygen boils at a higher temperature than nitrogen. So what can happen is liquid nitrogen can condense air into a cold trap. So in this case, there was a ton of airflow coming through. Oxygen from the air was able to condense into a liquid. Maybe it was a mixture of liquid air. Maybe it was pure liquid oxygen. Probably it was liquid air. And this poses a real hazard because any organic vapors that form from your reaction or boil off from your reaction can get trapped in the trap. But now those organics are in the presence of concentrated oxygen. So all it takes is a small bump in heat or a spark and suddenly it can all go catastrophically. It's often taught in research labs that you need to really make sure that when you're condensing stuff with liquid nitrogen that there's no way air can get in there because large amounts of air can result in large amounts of liquid oxygen which can result in large amounts of damage to your labs. So it's really important to be careful around cryogenic liquids. This is today's big story. How we turned our chemistry classroom into an NO2 gas chamber. So yeah, by the time that this story took place, I was already quite well known in my high school as a chemist, even though it was the first year, because of my amateur lab work. We were told by our teacher that we were going to do some experiments with hydrochloric and nitric acids. The thing you need to know is that we have lab work only on expanded chemistry lessons. Most of the class only learns theories, but students who choose to expand chemistry do actual experiments. For most of the class, it was their first contact with acids, so they were asking me about them before the lesson started. 
I was telling everyone not to let any copper into nitric acid because it will produce a highly toxic gas. And as we don't have a fume hood and as the ventilation is bad, it would be a huge hazard. Our teacher came into the classroom, gave everyone goggles, no gloves or lab coat. I was the only one in gloves because I brought my own PPE, brought out nitric acid. We were meant to dissolve copper in nitric acid, no fume hood, just on normal classroom tables, little to no ventilation. Well, we did it. At first, only a small green tail started coming off the copper. Then, as I gently swirled the test tube, it started generating a lot of nitrogen dioxide. We were meant to transfer nitrogen dioxide to a test tube with water and a pH indicator. The reason for this is water will react with nitrogen dioxide to form nitrous acid, and you could detect that with pH paper. Other students were just pouring the gas from one test tube into another. I decided to use that little beaker I got the acid in. It worked fairly well, until we realized that the reaction produces way more nitrogen dioxide than we had expected. It was pouring out of the test tubes onto our bench tops and into our lungs. I actually had smell issues that day, so when I took a breath, I didn't feel any smell. Just pure pain. What about the indicator tube? Well, it didn't change color, even when the teacher added 60% nitric acid. It turned out that it was no good anymore. We poured water into the test tubes to get rid of the gas. As I poured my tube into the sink, it filled up with a lot of nitrogen dioxide. It was a few liters of highly toxic gas leaking onto the floor. I started running water to convert all of it into the acid. My lungs hurt for the rest of the day. Next week, our teacher has shown the whole class not only the expanded chemistry part, the same reaction. This time, I was able to smell it. Best way to describe it? burnt steak plus rotting tomatoes. This is so terrifying, and this is the type of thing that should get a teacher fired, in my opinion. That is so scary, and generating gases in a non-well-ventilated area is a recipe for disaster at the best of times. A few years back, I had a decent home lab with all the proper equipment I needed to do various electroplating and etching. I used different solvents and acids depending on the metals I was working with. I got the idea that I needed to have a strong concentration of nitric acid at one point, and I could always dilute it down to the concentration I needed. I purified and cleaned up some sulfuric acid, and I was able to get some really clean nitrate salts with the recrystallization process. Mixed them in the stoichiometric amounts, and used my distillation apparatus to make red fuming nitric acid. I stored it in amber bottles to keep it from degrading. One day, after cleaning everything up to call it a day and changing back into my normal clothes, I noticed I had left the bottle with the nitric acid on the counter. I went over to move it back to its proper storage area, and knocked it off the shelf and it landed at my feet and broke. It covered my shoes and pants in acid, and before I could get them off, it burned clean through. I was concentrating on getting everything in water and getting my neutralizing solution down, knowing there was an ignition risk, when I should have been focusing on cleaning my skin off. That was a little over four years ago, and the scars on the top of my feet are still visible. I have gotten rid of all the lab equipment now and no longer do electroplating. That is so scary, and this highlights the importance of why you need to protect yourself first when something goes wrong. Clean off your skin, wash your body off, First, worry about the other consequences second. It's kind of like how on an airplane, they tell you to deal with your own mask first. I've got something to say about acetylene. First, don't lay an acetylene cylinder on its side. That stuff can explode if you stand it up again. And a small story. My welding teacher in trade school had the brilliant idea to leave the room where we had our gas welding class. And, as he returns, let's say that beforehand the room had four windows, but after that it had zero. And to myself, I never worked with oxyacetylene torches again after this. That is awful. Acetylene is no joke. I've talked about acetylene on the channel before. It's a really dangerous gas and things can go wrong even if you think you know what you're doing. So now that work is over for the year, I can talk about some of the stupidity I've seen. I work at a pool in the summer and I'm in charge of maintaining the chemicals. It's not hard unless the chlorine pumps, which pump 12% sodium hypochloride into the pools with a peristaltic pump. These pumps are about eight years old and are meant for indoor pools. They each have a dial with the following settings, low, two, three, four, five, and high. High is basically the pump running non-stop. Low is the pump barely running. No one knows what the numbers on the dial mean, so we don't do any fancy math to raise or lower the free chlorine, aka the still unreacted stuff. If it's too high, turn the dial down. If it's too low, turn it up. Well, one morning we come into work and find out that the free chlorine is at least 18 ppm. In almost every single pool in the country, the free chlorine is kept at around 5 ppm. This is comfortable for you. The guard who is measuring stopped when they reached 18 ppm, so I redid the test, thinking it has either user error or maybe the sample was taken right as the chlorine was being pumped. Nope, it was right. In fact, it was actually higher. It was at least 22 ppm. I also gave up testing. The pump had broken and at least 100 gallons of chlorine must have gone into the pool. Because we had to start emptying and refilling it, we likely drained about 20% of its water and replaced it that day, and, at the end of the day, I got the first real reading, which was 18%. The vinyl liner in that pool is now white instead of blue. <laughs> oh no! 
The chlorine sits in large tanks that are about 560 gallons. We have a total of seven of these, and we have to get them refilled halfway through the summer. So one morning, I arrive, and the large tanker truck is there to refill them. Later on, I notice one of the guys runs over to the pool edge and starts rapidly splashing water onto his face and rubbing his eyes. Later in the summer, they come back again, because we used more chlorine than we thought. And I see the same guys there, and just like before... I see this guy run over to the water and frantically splash his face and eyes. This dude likely splashed some of the chlorine on himself, and that stuff is horrifying. We have literally removed a partially dissolved bird from one of those tanks before. Ew, that's so gross. On a non-chemical note, I have seen some absolute stupid people working here. I saw a guy do a headfirst dive into three feet of water. The kids eat pool noodles for some reason, as in, I have seen a kid bite into a pool noodle, chew and swallow before I could stop him. It was a kid in the sixth grade. <laughs> For people not from America, someone in the sixth grade would be about 11 years old. In their defense, I also did some stupid stuff like reinflating some pool inflatables. The guy you can climb on and come up with warnings like do not swim under and keep away from muskrats. I'm not kidding about the muskrat part either. I don't get this. So if one of you wants to explain this in the comments, I'd appreciate it. So I basically took an air pump, the kind that plugs into the wall with two prongs and no ground and climb on the partially deflated platform to reinflate it, because I sure as heck wasn't dragging those things out of the pool, they were heavy, and I didn't have any coffee yet. And on a final note, when people take a dump in the pool, it usually isn't seen in time before it gets sucked up into the filters, not to mention diarrhea is almost never spotted. So if you ever go to a pool and smell that wonderful bleach smell, don't swim there, it is likely that that pool is very filthy, because that is the smell of reacted chlorine. The unreacted stuff smells like nothing, and is a comforting Mountain Dew green. If you don't believe this part about chlorine actually reacting with ammonia and stuff in the water, there's a great video from Mark Rober about this. This was a fairly minor one, but I got a mouthful of super glue. Basically, I was fixing a connector on the end of the tube, had glued it, and after waiting for the glue to dry, ran water through it to try and wash out any remaining glue. This didn't work, and long story short, it was a long enough tube to trap water fairly well. And a few minutes later, I managed to get a mouthful of super glue that somehow got stuck in the water without drying. Fortunately, I realized this as soon as it happened, and managed to spit it out. Though picking glue off your teeth isn't fun, oh my gosh. Why does super glue like to stay liquid on water for alarming amounts of time anyway? Also, to be clear, this is probably just a big drop of the stuff, in a lot of water, not like a mouthful of pure super glue. I would still really worry about eating monomers in general, because those monomers are really good Michael acceptors, and they will react with cysteine residues everywhere. So, definitely a great idea to keep super glue as far away from your mouth as possible. Everyone needs an acid vat episode, so I'll contribute this little number from a while ago. First off, not a chemist by profession or hobby, just usually the only one with enough sense around to actually understand that stuff can be dangerous. I'm in an industrial environment half the time, and one site we have large bulk storage for very nasty things, 93% sulfuric, 50% potassium hydroxide, and 50% hydrogen peroxide. Well, our big 12,000 gallon tank of sulfuric acid had a small leak one day, and we were told to just let it go for a bit while we continued operations. Eventually, we were able to use what was left in the tank, but by then we had a good 4 to 5 inches of very pure sulfuric acid in the containment dike, which was about 20 by 30 by 6, and it sat there for weeks. Eventually, the shallower parts became a greenish yellow slush slash crust as crystalline products started to show up. Well, management finally decides to get this horror show cleaned up, and it immediately goes to heck as the crew starts removing reinforced concrete by the shovelful. Our makeshift acid vat also managed to eat below the support pedestal for the bulk storage tank. Seven figures to cost that nonsense easily. Some heads rolled, thankfully. Why do people let problems marinate? I like to use the analogy of a dragon. If you deal with a problem when it's small, it's like a dragon when it's a dragon egg. You can crush a dragon egg. You have to spend some time doing it, maybe you'll hurt your foot, but what's better, crushing a dragon egg or fighting a dragon? The longer you wait, the bigger the dragon gets, and eventually that dragon starts laying eggs of its own. So deal with dragons before they get too big. Today's Yikes Awardee goes to 34CRMO4. The molecular biologist story reminded me of a biology teacher I had who spoke of his career path prior to being a teacher, which at one point included being in a lab where they at one point had a client send a large amount of radioactive monkey fecal matter of unknown origin. Why it was radioactive or why the client had so much of it, they were not told. They were tasked with finding any possible DNA sample they could scrounge from the fecal matter that could point to its origin, which unfortunately ended up giving no useful results. So he pointlessly handled large amounts of radioactive monkey poop in a lab environment. What the heck? I wonder what happened there. 
I'd love to know what happened there because that sounds like a really interesting potential story. Definitely yikes, but once I was distilling over some fuming nitric acid by heating up a mixture in a round bottom flask of potassium nitrate and sodium bisulfate. I've done this a few times, so I thought I'd leave it alone for a couple minutes and then check up on it later to find out one of the seals popped open, filling the entire garage with nitrogen dioxide fumes. We have two in this episode. I had to hold my breath, turn the heat off, and then open the garage door to let it all out. Lesson learned, I never leave a distillation unattended. Also, I just wanted to add the whole garage literally was hazy orange red from all the fumes. This is so scary, and I have a short on the old channel where I had a nitration going wrong. I'll include a link to that video in the description. You can tell the difference between a chemist and a plumber by asking them to pronounce unionized. If you want to check out more videos like this, I'll include a link to the compilation playlist in the description, and I hope you have a great day.